Good evening and, and welcome everyone. Um, it's great to have you all here for Kamaji's Bite Night number two, 2015. Um, for all of us at the Star Center and um, I think for many of the faculty and students here, this is really one of our favorite nights of the year, one of our favorite moments um, of the academic year at Washington College because we get to hear about and learn about and celebrate the great work that's being done by some of our superb Washington College students in many departments and, and many fields. Um, I want to start out by um, talking about Kamaji's bite itself. Now, um, Dr. Black and Dr. Hall sitting there at the table in the in the back of the in the back of the room. Um, you guys sort of remind me of like the um, those Muppets, Statler and Waldorf, you know, like up on the back. <laughs> I don't know something. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> um, anyway, in their in their grouchy Statler and Waldorf way, they wanted. They told me that the. Uh, that the Elm today, apparently there's a very nice article about the Kamaji's Bite program, but there's some confusion in the Elm about how exactly to spell and punctuate Kamaji's Bite, which admittedly is not the easiest thing to, to remember, but it's Kamaji's without an apostrophe um, and without a hyphen either, just Kamaji's Bite, B-I-G-H-T, not B-I-T-E. Um, and Special prize to anybody who knows what a bite, B-I-G-H-T, is. English faculty are disqualified from this one. Okay, history, history faculty. Um, yeah, a, a bite, as I'm sure many of you know, is a, is a body of water. It's a small bay or an inlet. And so you may wonder, how did this fellowship come to be named after a small bay or an inlet? specifically the small bay or inlet named after a 17th century Dutch immigrant named Cornelius Comages, who settled along the Chester River in the mid 1600s. Well, um, it is actually um, thanks to a family, a gentleman from which is here with us tonight, Tom Collier, um, who is the original, we might say, founding father Remember the founding family of the Comages Bite Fellowships. Um, Tom and his wife, Ginger, um, and their daughters came up with the idea for these fellowships um, over 10 years ago now, um, inspired by the place where they, where they live, which is this inlet called Comages Bite on the Chester River, and in fact, specifically in an 18th century house called the Comages Bite House. And the idea was that these fellowships would be um, about getting students out into the world beyond campus to explore America's past and present. Um, much in the spirit that uh, you can find America's past and present to be explored in a place like Comagee's Bite and the Comagee's Bite House. Um, so from that initial idea, this program grew that now, over a decade later, has given extraordinary experiences to dozens and dozens of Washington College students. In fact, this year, 13 Washington College students who have gone far afield beyond the shores of the Chester River, indeed far ashore beyond the fields of the Chesapeake Bay, and, and even in a couple of cases beyond the Atlantic Ocean, um, to have adventures far and wide. The Common Juice Bite Fellowships um, pay for students to take fully paid internships at some of America's and indeed the world's leading cultural institutions and historical institutions. Um, not only do they, do they fund these students in positions that otherwise would be very um, difficult to, to get paid or unpaid, um, but also we at the Star Center and on the fellowship committee match students up with specific positions each year. So basically, um, we talk to people that we know at these institutions, curators, directors, librarians, archivists, and we say, okay, well, if we could find for you a butt-kicking Washington College student who could come and work with you and that we can guarantee that they will be awesome and doing an amazing job, because of course all Washington College students are awesome, but some are more awesome than others. Don't tell anyone I said that. We'll find you an absolutely awesome student to come and work with you next summer. Um, would you hold an internship spot um, for that person? Um, and not only have we found that they do this, but we've found that once they've had one Washington College student come and work with them, 
they reserve a spot for our students year after year after year. And, and one of the best things at the end of every summer is the emails that come pouring in to me and my colleagues at the Star Center saying, we just love the students that you send us from Washington College. They consistently do great work, and we can't wait um, for you to send more students to us, we hope, next year. So that's something that we are very, very proud of. We're proud of the work that, uh, that all of our students have done. And, and this year's group of, su of students, I have to say, was um, as terrific as, as any that we've, that we've had before. Um, so I'd like to say um, thank you to our generous supporters of the Comedies Bite program, especially our, our founders, the Collier family. I'd also like to say thank you to the Washington College faculty and staff who support this program. In the audience tonight, I see not, not only Professor Statler and Walter, I mean Professors Black and Hall, but also Professor Sorrentino, the chair of the history department, um, Dean De Quinzio, and um, I'm sorry if I'm missing others in the, in the dimness here, um, but I also want to uh, thank our family members, some of whom we have here with us this evening, I know, who have um, given great support to our Comedies Bite fellows over the, over the summer. And thanks as well to my colleagues at the Star Center, Michael Buckley, Gene Wortman, and Jennifer Emley for the hard work that they put into this program every summer. Um, they, uh, they make it look easy most of the time, I think, to our, to our students, um, but they work very, very hard to make this happen. So without further ado, um, I'll introduce the first of our student presenters, who is Tara Sullivan, who graduated in uh, May with the class of 2015. She is a history major. She hails from right here in Stevensville, Maryland. She interned at the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History in New York City for the summer. Um, and actually, she um, is now, she had to, uh, to travel, well, she's She's still living at home, but she is um, now a graduate student at the University of Maryland College Park. So we're delighted to welcome her back to Chestertown and Washington College to tell us about her summer. As Adam introduced, I'm Tara Sullivan. This summer, I, I worked at the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History in New York City, and I had the great pleasure of working with early American documents from primarily from the Civil War, or sorry, not Civil War, the Revolutionary War, but I also worked with some from uh, the Civil War and World War II. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is a diary that I worked with from Thomas Askin, Jr. in 1938. He was 17 years old and he, enrolled, he enlisted in the military. He was supposed to be discharged in October 13th, on October 13th of 1941, which happened to be one day before his 21st birthday. This, however, was not able to come to pass because he was stationed on a, on a naval ship that was in the ocean. And he was not very happy about this about not being able to get out when he was scheduled to. But, and there's this quote, uh, 21 years old and not much to show for it. But what continues on after that is, is, I'm feeling quite low today because the exec said that he's only sending six men back in the bunch and I was number 10. So he was so close. But unfortunately, as his luck would go, this wasn't the end of it. If you'll note on the bottom of the pages how he marks a negative one, he, from the day that he was supposed to be um, discharged, he's keeping track of every day later that he stays. Go forward to 41 and 42 days later. In, our, in December, yeah, in December, December 5th, he finally got his notification that he was going to be going home. He was going, and he was very excited about this. But as we all know, December 5th, 1941, was one day before Pearl Harbor. Oh no, sorry, yes, it was one day before Pearl Harbor. Two days before Pearl Harbor, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, and which he notes in his diary on the next on the his next entry which is the Japs have attacked Hawaii and 
then the following day, the United States has declared war in Japan, at which time all discharges were finished. No one was being sent home. Not only did, because his diary stops right after this, this is the last page of his diary, but we know from his service records, which are also housed at the archive, that he went on to serve throughout the entire war and decided to go into, to finish out a, as a career naval officer and did not get out of the Navy until 1958. So while he wasn't, an, wasn't happy about not being discharged, he, he, at the beginning, he obviously decided that maybe it wasn't so bad and decided to stay in for much longer than, than the um, war. The second and the biggest project that I worked on this summer was, transcri was transcribing an entire Revolutionary War diary. It was the diary of Ezra Tilden. And, the pay and what we did with this transcription, after transcribing the diary, we made two neat line projects that will be put up on the, web on the school's website, not the school, on the website. And the first project was a map tracking his pattern, tracking his movements through the two years that, of the diary that we have. And the second map is of Ticonderoga. And at this map, there are interactive locations where that when you click on them, pictures from the diary pages as shown up here, appear and they have annotations and quotes that describe what life at a Revolutionary War encampment would have been like. And the quote that I have pulled up here is particularly interesting because it's the only example of a coded section in this work. After, we, after decoding the section, we realized that Tilden wrote this section in code because he was talking badly about the officers and was presumably worried that they would come across this journal and read this and he, he would be highly punished for it. And I presume this because, late, because further on in the diary, he talks about the whippings that another soldier received for insulting an officer. So he had, he had cause, cause to be weary. But what this says when it's decoded is it starts, starts with, it seems to me our great men or officers try to, and this is where the code begins, cheat and wrong the men as much as they possibly can and make, this, make the poor soldiers fare bad for their ill actions but they will not always get men's trust if they serve them so. For I understand that we do not, we are not to draw billeting money nor 10 shillings old tender for every 20 miles further, which they should have at this point. And the, the last major part of my summer that I would like to highlight is the last collection I worked with, which was an abolitionist scrapbook um, and this letter in particular was written by Frederick Douglass to Maria Webb. Maria Webb was a resident of Ireland and she was very active in the, an, in the anti-slavery movement. This letter written in 1859 was shortly after the John Brown raid. Um, while Frederick Douglass did not participate in this event, he was, he was accused of being a conspirator and in this letter that he's writing to Maria, he's telling her of why he had to flee the country, because he went to Canada and then to England at this point. And he's saying that he left because I could never hope to get out of the state alive. If they did not kill me for being concerned with dear old Brown, they would have done so for my being Frederick Douglass. And this was right before, he, or this was, he wrote this letter after he'd left the United States. When he, was he was aware that the John Brown raid had occurred and it was shortly after he was actually teaching a class when someone came in to tell him and it was at that point that he left because they, the John Brown raid had just happened and people were already looking for him. And these were just some of the collections and some of the things that I did over the summer. Um, the, the experience was absolutely phenomenal and I, this, Adam mentioned that I'm in graduate school right now. I also have received a year-long fellowship at the National Agricultural Library, which I have started now. And I wholeheartedly want to thank the Comptes by 
program and donors for this opportunity this past summer because I was told after I got the position that my experience from this summer was a key deciding factor in my receiving this fellowship. And I want to say thank you again to everyone for their support and particularly to the Country Spite um, organization and donors and everyone here. Thank you. Uh, the, the Gilder Lerman organization. Okay, certainly. The Gilder Lerman Institute was founded in the early 1990s by um, Mr. Gilder and Mr. Lerman, who were originally private collectors of early American history pieces, documents. And in the early 90s, they came together and decided that they wanted to make a, a public organization to display their documents. Their, due to their personal interests, most of the collection was Revolutionary War and Civil War. Since that time, the Gilder Lehrman organization has tried, has been actively collecting material that spans the United States history, which is why we have some of the World War II, we have World War I, to, to make it a more complete representation of American history. And not only do they have their archive open to researchers, but very uniquely, as I'm finding now that I'm in, in graduate school, the Gilder Lehrman Institute has a l large emphasis on education at lower levels. Lower levels meaning not research levels. So sorry, undergra um, undergraduate students, high school students, even elementary school students. They, bring, they, they encourage school groups to come in to show them primary documents um, to get children engaged with learning history at a much younger age, and I think that that is absolutely phenomenal. Yes? Can you tell us any more about your own um, graduate school program and plans and, and how this relates to, to what you're, you're looking to do as a career? Yes. I'm going to the University of Maryland College Park, and I am pursuing a Master of Library Science with a specialization in archives and digital curation. So this past summer's internship was exactly the kind of thing that I would like to be doing full time after I graduate next year. Um, and because of this work in archives and the digital projects, particularly the neat line ex exhibitions that I did with T Tilden's Diary is what got me the position of a digital curation fellow at the National Agricultural Library where I'll be making online exhibits based on their archival collections. So this is, this was very, very closely representative of what I'd like to do, continue doing. Thanks so much, Tara. And, um, and as you can tell, one of the, the things that we really love about these fellowships is the way that not only do they give students experiences that in and of themselves are, are worthwhile and, and exciting and challenging, but also they're a way to sort of continue the, the trajectory of their intellectual lives and, and professional lives um, beyond campus to carry, sort of carry um, their Washington College education with them and also to give them an extra boost as they launch themselves into exciting and, and often quite competitive careers in the, in the, professional, in the professional world. So we, we really um, congratulate Tara and also congratulate her family um, who are here with us tonight and thank you for coming and for your um, support of, of Tara and of this program. Um, I want to, uh, to, to make a, a, another quick uh, announcement. Michael Buckley asked me to mention that in the back of the room, um, we have some literature about the Star Center's other programs this semester. And also for those students who are here, we have information about the Comagee's Bite program and how to apply for it. Um, and also about some of the other opportunities with the Star Center this semester, all kinds of public programs and research projects and other stuff. So we'd encourage you to pick up some of that literature and. Um, fill out an interest sheet if you haven't done so already this semester so we can be in touch with you. Um, our next um, presenter is actually presenting from the far side of the Atlantic, spanning thousands of miles. 
Aldo Ponteroso was an exchange student here at Washington College last year from the University of London Royal Holloway College. Um, he spent a summer internship at the U.S. House of Representatives Office of the Historian in Washington, um, as well as working briefly at the end of the summer for the U.S. Capitol Historical Society. And he is reporting to us via pre-recorded video from across the pond since um, it's now almost midnight over there. We tried to figure out if we could get him to Skype, but it didn't exactly work. So pre-recorded Aldo, we were especially excited about Aldo's fellowship because this was the first time that an international student um, received this Kamaji Spite Fellowship. And they are a growing contingent at Washington College, as you know. Um, and so we're excited that we could make this opportunity available to them as well. And as, as Aldo May um, mentioned in this, in this video, he got extremely, extremely enthusiastic about the American experience through this fellowship. So um, do I hit play somewhere or? OK. He won't be taking questions. <laughs> Hi everyone, hello again Washington College. Um, my name is Aldo and this summer I was a Comedy Spite Fellow and I was working at the Historian's Office at the House of Representatives. Um, so first off, I'm really sorry that I can't be there tonight. I'm an exchange student and I'm back in England now, um, about to finish uh, the last year of my own studies here. But I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what I got up to over the summer and talk about what I like best, what I learned, um, and then if you guys have any questions, please feel free to email me, look me up on Facebook, or um, Gene will pass along my contact details to you, I'm sure. Um, so first of all, I'll talk a little bit about what the office actually does. Um, the House Historian's Office is in charge of recording and interpreting the history of the house. So that means they do a lot of publication work, and they do a lot of work with classrooms as well. They teach a class every week at the house. And they also really try and engage people on their websites. They have loads of archives online and research materials and tools online geared towards historians, but also towards younger generation. So a lot of the work that the interns do there is research for the website with a mind to putting that work onto the website. And alongside that, the house is also working on a print volume of South Pacific Islanders in Congress. So interns will also help with the research for that. So a lot of what I was doing, and if you decide to apply to this internship, is you'll be doing a lot of uh, random little snippets of research that don't seem to correlate, but ultimately they come together in either one volume or one section of the website. Uh, so just to give you an example, the house at the moment, as I said, is working on this book, South Pacific Islanders in Congress. And the first day I got there, Matt Wisniewski, the house historian, uh, asked me to research everything that Fofo Samoa, who was the delegate for American Samoa in the 1980s, had ever said in two appropriations meetings. And this seemed completely random to me. I, I really didn't understand the point <laughs> of what I was doing. Um, but then Mr. Wisniewski took what I had done and wrote up a nice little biography of Mr. Sunia. So aside from that, you'll also get to do a lot of your own research and a lot of your own writing, if that's something you're interested in. So these are usually take the form of what's called a historical highlight, and these are just short tidbits of history that you get to write, you get to be in charge of what goes into your short piece, and you're also in charge of the research and deciding what is relevant to the house's history. And that can be quite difficult and daunting. Um, writing for an office full of professional writers will make you a better writer and it will harness your uh, and sharpen your writing ability, definitely. It, it definitely makes you sweat a bit. <laughs> but um, so you can write these historical highlights and those, if they're good enough, can go up onto the website and people can come and read your work. And I thought that was pretty neat. Um, the biggest project I, work on, I worked on this year, and probably my favourite, was a blog post. These are similar to the highlights, but they're a lot more punchy, and you get a lot more freedom with how you write. So you can be more adventurous in your writing style. You can have a little bit of fun with the reader. And these are typically about 800 words, 
And again, you have to go and do all your own research. So you'll be in the Library of Congress a lot. You'll probably be working with microfilm a lot, which was a new experience for me. I'd never worked with microfilm. Uh, it's very fiddly, but definitely enjoyable. And you can see that a lot of these newspapers and documents that are in microfilm haven't been looked at for years, which is really pretty neat to think that you're one of very few people sifting through this history. So that was how I came about writing the blog post there, and that's also on the house, house's website now. The, uh, the really interesting thing, I think, and probably my favorite thing about this particular Comedy Spite internship uh, is the intern lecture series that you're allowed to go to. Because you work for the house, you have a little orange badge, and that enables you to walk through Congress to most areas, especially on the house side. You have a lot of freedom in where you can go, and it also entitles you to go to the lecture series that they put on. And you'll get some really interesting speakers there, like Steve Forbes or Nancy Pelosi was there. John Boehner comes as well. Um, you get some senators like Steve Coons, Thomas Carp of Delaware. They're just a great way to meet other interns and you'll feel like you have your finger on the pulse of Washington DC politics, definitely. Um, so that was definitely a very unique and special thing about this internship, but uh, I'm biased. <laughs> um, so aside from all the writing and the research that I was doing, I was definitely challenged in my perceptions of history and public history especially. It's quite shocking to think about being in charge of history, what the public get to see and what they don't get to see. You're expected to be a custodian of what goes out there onto the website and what is out there for public consumption. So that's a lot of pressure and I found that quite challenging to deal with. But speaking to my boss and my colleagues in the office, it's something that's if you ever want to write, you've got to do and it's difficult but it's definitely worth it um, it's a great feeling when you finish writing something and you feel like it's good <laughs> so that in very short spiel is what I did this summer and please if you have any more questions shoot me an email um, I think my essay is going up online at some point you're welcome to give that a read and if you're considering applying, then please also talk to me as well. I'd, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. Bye, Washington College. See you soon. Yeah. Will the freedom fill in one shot? Okay, just make sure you get all the freedom. Okay, thanks. Anybody who knew Aldo w won't be surprised that there was a little twist at the end <laughs> there. Um, and uh, I, you know, in, in what Aldo um, said, it, it, if you're sensing a theme here, so many of, of our Comagee's Bite fellows find themselves writing and researching and then sharing that writing and research with larger audiences. So um, here at Washington College, they're also learning to write and research, but sharing that usually with an audience of maybe even just one person, the, the professor, maybe with the whole class, but here they are putting it out in front of the world, and that's a transformative experience for them. Um, also, Aldo didn't, didn't mention this, but um, I hope I can speak for him and say that he had such a fantastic time in Washington this summer that um, he's decided he'd, he'd kind of like to live here. And he's planning to do his master's degree probably over in the UK, and then he'd like to come to law school in the States. He's already bought a stack of LSAT books, and um, he'd like to come to law school over here and study international law and live in Washington, D.C. and do that. So for him, this really was, I think, a life-changing experience in, in more ways than just academic. Our next speaker um, is Leo Witt, also a 2015 graduate of Washington College, a history major from Westminster, Maryland, and he worked at the Maryland Historical Society in Baltimore, to which we have another special connection in that Dr. Collier is the president of the board of the Historical Society um, as well. So uh, Leo, we look forward to hearing about your experience. Thank you, Adam. Okay. 
So, like Adam said, my name is Leo, and I spent my summer at the Maryland Historical Society in Baltimore. So, um, I'll give you guys some brief history about the Historical Society. It was founded in 1844, and it is Maryland's oldest continuously operating cultural institution. Um, it, ho it currently houses over 350,000 historical objects, including 2,000 works of art, and the library contains over 7 million books and documents. So that's a lot of stuff. Um, my main uh, responsibility at the Historical Society had to do with the textile collection, with, which consists of over 6,000 articles of clothing, mainly women's clothing, as I'm sure Dr. Schreiner, if he was here, he would tell you that uh, women's clothing is, is more often preserved well than uh, men's clothing. Um, the dates of these items um, typically range between the early 1700s and 1960s, and it was last organized in the 1980s by retired house keeper Enola Williams, who's pictured here. And um, she basically, at that time, placed the objects in boxes and organized them as best she could, um, not really um, conscious as, um, to preservation as, as today, today's standards. Excuse me. Um, so this summer marked the beginning of a, a rehousing project for these items. And uh, they had three graduate students who would take an item out of the box, clean it as best they could, making sure not to damage any of the fabric, and uh, rehouse it in a, a, a situate in a way that would be more better for preservation. Um, now my responsibility uh, was if they found an item of particular interest, um, they would give me the date of the item and the name of the person who believed, who they believed to have worn it. And I would then take that information and go to the library, which here, uh, the H. Furlong Baldwin Library is the library at, at the Historical Society. And um, I would try to find out everything I could about the person who wore it and try to find anything about their family, who they married, how many children they had, their parents, any kind of genealogical information, as well as um, any kind of context for the item itself, when they could, what was going on in the person's life when they wore the item. So mainly I used um, the Dealman Hayward files at the library, which is a card file. And if I found uh, the person's name in this file, I could typically find their full name, their maiden name, their date of birth or death, and uh, who they married. And in this case here, I don't, you probably can't read that well, but um, you can find out um, when they married, who they married, and who administered the marriage. So that was interesting as well. Um, as well as uh, sometimes you could find their children's names or their parents. Sometimes if the card said, see overflow file, I knew that I, I had a lot more information at my disposal, which I would then go to the overflow files here, pictured in these cabinets here. And um, typically, one of these files could contain mainly newspaper, newspaper clippings, um, I, typically an obituary. And from that, I could find out how the person lived, how they were remembered, where they lived, and a lot more about the person's family. Um, it could also contain uh, interesting articles about something they did in the community or a promotion that they received in a company or an appointment to a public office. So if I found an overflow file, that I, I hit it big with that person. So that was only my main responsibility. I worked with almost every department at the Historical Society while I was there, and I did a lot of work with the education department on their historical investigations portal, which is an online program that um, uh, teachers in Maryland will be able to use with their students to help them learn Maryland history in a way that's more fun and interactive. There they can log on and see pictures of actual documents from, uh, well, I'll, I'll discuss that, um, as well as um, hearing audio clips from oral histories. And that's what I spent most of my time doing with the education department was transcribing original documents such as runaway slave advertisements, legal papers, and letters. As, but most of my time 
uh, with the education department had to do with selecting clips of audio from oral histories. Uh, and this may not look like a lot here. This, this is uh, transcriptions of all the uh, oral histories they have, which doesn't seem like a lot, but there are hours upon hours of oral histories at, at the Maryland Historical Society. So I spent a lot of my time listening and, and reading a lot of these oral histories and trying to find the best clips that would um, give an overall picture to grade school students as to uh, topics such as World War I, World War II, immigration, labor reform, and civil rights. That was one of the more enjoyable, the most enjoyable uh, experiences I had there. Um, I also spent my time working on a library subject guide, which is a collection of the documents that are available in the library to be used uh, either by library staff, staff of the whole institution, or patrons who come into the library. It's basically a short list of documents that may be helpful on a, t a, on a specific topic. Um, some examples would be the War of 1812, African American history, and maritime history. I spent my time trying to find everything that I could find on prohibition and temperance. This was because I did my senior thesis on Baltimore during prohibition, and they thought this would be a good opportunity to get someone who enjoys that topic to find all the, the documents on that topic that they could. And I found, I don't even know how many I found. I never counted them up, but it was many, many pages long of, of, of these documents. So if I ever pursue that topic further, I know where I'm going to, to find my research. Um, this is just a, um, my last week there. I had finished, by, by my last week, I had finished all my projects, so it didn't make sense to start anything new since I wouldn't be able to complete it. So um, my last week, I spent most of my time um, with the exhibitions manager, um, Paul Rubinson, and he took me around to some of the storage areas that they have at the Historical Society, and that was the first time that I, like I said before, over 350,000 objects. That seems like a lot that you, you don't really have an idea of how many that is until you see how many rooms of storage they have at the Historical Society. And he kept leading me into room after room of this one's all couches, this one's all chairs. And I, my mind was blown as to how many objects they really have there and how much it, it's, it's just mind blowing. But I, I helped him here, pictured on the left, um, this is a flat file cabinet that contained some drawings and some um, journals. And we moved it from run, one room to another. And that, that it was a big uh, project for only two people to, to take on. And it only took a day for, for that one. But I think we did all the ones in the left here that you can see as well. And um, that was my first time handling objects and really trying to make sure uh, how do you move items from one room to another without damaging them. And, and that was my first taste of that. And, and my only regret was that I couldn't do more of that because I spent most of my time in the library and I, I wish I had spent more time with the objects themselves. Um, and picture on the right here is uh, art storage. And these pull-out walls probably extend an extra 15 or 20 feet to the right. And like I said, 2,000 works of art and this is only a fraction of what they have here. So they have so many works of art that it was, they were hanging up in the library um, out for display. So um, some of the benefits I had from working here, uh, I gained a lot of uh, library research skills as well as managing multiple projects. I worked with every department almost. And um, at first it was difficult to, to manage projects for each uh, department, but as time went on, it, it was a lot easier to, to prioritize my tasks and make sure that everything gets done. I also uh, learned how to properly handle documents and items, which will be helpful in my future um, as a historian. And I ex this was my first experience in a, a business setting, and um, I think that really prepared me for uh, a future job as I'll understand how an office setting works and, and how that environment, how people interact in that environment. So that was my first taste of that. And I also uh, gained an understanding of what I can do as a historian. That was one of my biggest goals going in here was to find out 
well, I've been studying history for so long, what do I do with it exactly? This was my opportunity to see um, how all these people who are working there work together and what do they do specifically to create um, a comprehensive history of Maryland. And I, I believe this internship really helped me with that. So um, I want to thank the donors as well as the Star Center and the college as a whole for uh, making this opportunity possible because it has definitely better prepared myself for the future and I enjoyed it greatly. So thank you. Uh, I wondered if you could uh, tell us uh, an anecdote or, or something uh, that amused you about the prohibition in Baltimore. Well, one of the most interesting things, I didn't really know anything about Baltimore during prohibition when I first started my research for the thesis. But um, as time went on, I realized that even though it's a major city, when you think of cities in, in America, you think Baltimore's definitely high up on the list. But when you think of prohibition, you typically think of New York or Chicago or Atlantic City, not Baltimore. Why? And I, I was wondering, why is that? And it, it, I learned over time that it was because there wasn't, what stereotyp what's stereotypical about prohibition is that you have uh, crime syndicates, you have mobsters, you have Al Capone, and they, didn't, they weren't really there in Baltimore too much. And that's because Albert C. Ritchie, governor at the time of Maryland, um, he did not let local law enforcement enforce prohibition. It, was, it all had to be done through federal law enforcement. And that with the fact that people completely disregard, I mean, all across America, people disregarded prohibition. But in Baltimore in particular, they had a little bit more freedom to do so. And because of that, they made their own liquor. They found their own ways of getting liquor. And um, because of that, gangsters didn't really have anything to do with Baltimore. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. <laughs> Yes, Dr. Black. What, what is it that gets a, um, a piece of clothing into the collection? Is it the person who wore it, or is it something unique about the style of the clothing? Um, I, think it's, I think it's just that it's an article of clothing that we own at the Historical <laughs> Society. And I, I mean, I didn't get it. I, didn't, I wasn't in the room with the graduate students while they pull items off the shelf. I didn't know every item that they pulled, but if they found something that was from a prominent Maryland family. I remember the first one I did was um, from, uh, was worn by Margareta Sophia Ridgely, uh, who the Ridgely family owns the Hampton in uh, Towson, the Hampton um, estate. And I remember I was doing a lot of research for them. I actually constructed an entire um, family tree, or not an entire family tree, because the Ridgely family spent, spans a really long time past. but. Um, I constructed a little bit of a family tree for the Ridgely family because they had a lot of items from that family. So they definitely wanted to take some of the items from that family and, and maybe eventually put it on display as this is Ridgely family clothing. So, yes? I think you could do a little bit more about the audio that you were working with. Like, mm -hmm. what format is it in and how do you preserve it? Um, it was on. Um, cassette tapes, mainly. Um, and I would talk to um, the chief uh, library um, person, and they would, uh, if they hadn't uh, digitized most of the collection yet, and because I was pulling all these things, it, it really hadn't been touched too much, the oral histories. Um, but slowly, they were digitizing them, and I, I would read the transcripts I, I don't, but the, the wall of um, paper there, um, I would read through those first, and if I found something, I'd be like, oh, that's interesting, I want to hear that, and he would digitize that. And That's actually, I didn't finish that project. I, I got most of, I got clips and audio histories from each one, each topic, several of them, and, and they were going to continue that 
after I've left, so. Mm. Anybody else? No? Okay, thank you. Thanks so much, Leo, and, and congratulations. And our next speaker is Jake Wilde, who is a senior this year and a history and secondary education major from Doylestown, Pennsylvania, and he interned at the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. Okay, thank you for coming, everybody. Um, like Professor, uh, Professor Goodhart said, I uh, am Jake Wilde. I am a senior uh, history major, secondary ed minor, um, which basically means that in the next year or so, I'm going to try to be a social studies teacher here in Maryland. And I did spend my summer at the National Constitution Center. Um, my internship lasted about 10 weeks, um, and I was there full time. And I was the education department's intern. And I worked for basically two people. The first was the Veep of Veep, basically. Um, and her name was Curry Sautner. And she was the VP of Visitor Experience, Education, and Public Programs. So she covered a kind of wide range. So I didn't get to see her every day, but she was kind of like the guiding hand for what I was doing. And then uh, beneath her, who ran the education department, was a guy named Mike Adams. And he was kind of like my day-to-day -day supervisor who gave me like my everyday projects and kind of kept an eye on me and helped me out. Uh, so what did I do there? Um, I did a number of things. Uh, first off, every couple weeks, I would say about every three weeks, the center uh, helped host teacher workshops, which were in partnership with the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, uh, Historic Philadelphia Incorporated, um, and basically the NCC would play host to these workshops. And they would bring in um, all kinds of like great uh, constitutional scholars, uh, other teachers, um, just basically uh, people who had written books about uh, the topics they were talking about. And these teachers would come and they'd spend about a week and they would learn from all these different individuals. And so I got to sit in on a lot of these. I had to help set, set them up, make the teacher bags, pretty much anything uh, that they needed we did. And there was uh, four, uh, three other interns with me, there was four of us. Um, and if you can see the top picture, I took that basically sitting in the back of the room. That's Akhil Amar. He's a constitutional scholar. Um, and he would be the type of person that would show up at these uh, workshops and he would talk to the teachers. And as somebody who wanted to be a teacher, this was so awesome to watch because, you know, I got to sit there and see what other teachers were currently teaching and how they were teaching it and what these scholars thought they should be teaching. And as a twist of fate, um, when August rolled around, I'm currently doing my teaching internship at Queen Anne's County High School, and I got assigned government and honors government as my two classes for 10th grade. So a lot of what I got to sit in on those workshops, I'm now trying to put into my own classroom. Uh, so the second big thing that came up almost immediately was, I don't know if anybody here has heard of them, but it's Constitution High School. It's about two blocks from the Constitution Center, and it's a magnet school for teaching civics and democracy. And so the NCC plays host to a bunch of events for them. They have programs that they share, but the big thing is they host their graduation. And so I got called into Curry's office like in the first week, and she said, well, you're the closest person that's graduated in high school, so you're going to be doing a lot here. So I was like, okay. So a lot of what I had to do was organize you know, the list of the students. How are they going to line up? How are they going to stand? Where are we going to put them? I had to make all of the cards for them. Um, just kind of a lot of the grunt work for the graduation. And then on the actual day, I you know, had to wear the headset and stand at the next to the stage and kind of monitor things for her because she was way up on the balcony. And I had to move people, that kind of thing. So it was really cool to see how high school graduation works behind the scenes. And hopefully, I'll be doing them in the future. And then my big project, which I guess I would characterize as my favorite, um, was something we called Colonial Field Day. And on my very first day, I had to go into a conference meeting for a joint programs meeting, which was all the different departments meeting together and trying to figure out how they can come up with things together to do for the visitors. And this got pitched in the, in the meeting. And so I got to see it like originally from its original idea. And basically, the goal was to host a series of games and military musters and events on the front lawn, hoping to draw people into the museum for programming. And I took that picture down, down beneath that as well, and that's a group of people at Colonial Field Day. And the reason this is my favorite is because I did pretty much everything from, uh, I started out by contacting people trying to rent tents to seven in the morning, me and uh, the manager, Mike Adams, were you know hammering the tents in. 
So if anybody needs help putting up tents, I can do that. Um, and it finished with you know me interacting with visitors out on the lawn, answering questions, helping them do things. Um, I don't think I think I have a picture later of the military muster right there. It just looks like the group is meeting, um, but that would be uh, every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from July, I think ninth on until I left in the middle of August. So that was an ongoing event, and it was a kind of a big thing. Um, a really cool thing I got to do too was uh, when I got there, my manager Mike had just started as well. And his big goal was to kind of revamp all of the uh, field trip guides and lesson plans that they have online. And since I was hoping to be a teacher, he was like, hey, well, you want to help me write the lesson plans and we're going to redo the field trip guides. And I was thinking, oh, that's going to be something small, like no big deal. Um, it actually took like weeks and weeks. I had to go into the exhibit every day and come up with tons of ideas. And then, of course, he'd eliminate some of them and I'd have to go back in and try to narrow it down. Um, but when I left, they had just gotten approved by the design team. So the field trip guides that all the students from, or at least for the next couple of years that go to the center will be doing uh, the field trip guides that I made, which I think is you know pretty cool as a teacher. So yeah, I get to, I mean, hopefully bring that into maybe interviews in the future with school districts and say I got to make the field trip guides. Um, and then we had three big events. Um, I didn't get to participate in the third one, obviously, because that's today. Um, so they're having a crazy day there. But uh, in the last month or so, I had to help kind of update things and make things for them and help them get you know off the ground. But I was there for Flag Day, and you can see in the bottom that's a giant flag folding right outside of the, uh, Independence Hall. And I started it, and then of course I knew I needed pictures. So once we got the first folding going, I backed up and tried to take a quick picture. Um, but Flag Day was a pretty big day. I think I have pictures also coming up. Um, it was huge. It was in partnership with almost all of the centers in historic Philadelphia. And I don't know if anybody's been down there uh, on July 2nd, but they call it the All-America Celebration. They give away the free Wawa hoagies. Um, that was a <laughs> crazy day. Um, it was unbelievable. It was, I did pretty much anything that Curry needed. I kind of just followed her around all day, and I had to be ready to run. Um, and actually, on Flag Day, I had to sprint back and forth between Independence Hall and the Constitution Center because my boss had lost her cell phone the night before. So I kind of played cell phone for her. So my contribution to Dan CC, I kind of hit all of those while I was going through those projects. So um, I did help participate in graduating students who um, were seeking a future in civics and democracy. Um, I participated in hosting people to the museum of what they call We the People. Uh, during holiday celebrations, so when you know tons of people are like, "Oh, it's a it's a holiday for America. Where do we go?" Well, they go to the National Constitution Center, and you know we tried to help them uh, learn while they were there. And I helped host teachers for workshops to improve their knowledge and methods of teaching uh, the Constitution in America's classrooms. And then hopefully I get to kind of take that into my own classroom. And like I said, I helped to revamp the uh, field trip core guides for all the student groups that will visit, um, which we hope will educate students that come to the center in civics and education. And for what can I take with me in the future, I've also kind of hit those. But like I said, I'm, I was, from the time I was in seventh grade, I wanted to be a high school teacher. It was just kind of something I saw and was like, that's what I want to do. Um, but this gave me a unique experience to see it from a different side. Uh, a lot of people that work at the National Constitution Center are edu uh, history majors or education majors. And you know, almost all of them have a master's degree in one of the two. Um, and so I got to see what other people are doing with those degrees outside of the classroom. It's it's still education, it's just a different kind of education. And so I got to see like, how do you approach educating people when you only have them for a day versus having them for a year or a semester, or whatever it may be. Um, I also got to see uh, field trips from the other side. I don't know if anyone's ever seen 3,000 kids in a little museum, but it gets loud, it gets crazy, and it was different playing host instead of being on the field trip. And you get to realize, you know, when you go as a student, it's a lot different when you're actually working at the place hosting those people. So, and uh, the picture at the top is the military muster, and you can see the soldier walking down the line kind of yelling at people. That was part of Colonial Field Day. Um, so I had to contact them and kind of work with HPI to get uh, the, what they called historical interpreters, not reenactors, to come do those. And then the bottom left is the very end of July 2nd. And you can see the place was still pretty crowded. Um, I would say it was probably three times as crowded at like 1 o'clock. And then the middle is the COO of the Constitution Center doing the fra uh, flag raising on Flag Day. Right outside the center, that's pretty much a view. Where I'm standing is you're viewing the Independence Hall right to your left across the mall. And then on Flag Day, you can see in the bottom right, they actually had skydivers jump out of planes with flags on their backs. 
and they came down in a big uh, arc, and they kind of arced down, and they all landed on Independence Mall. So that's one of the people just getting to the bottom of the ground. But there were about six or seven more uh, up on an angle, and the last one, two people were connected with a flag in between. So it was a pretty cool experience. Um, like they all kind of said, thank you so much to the donors. Thank you to the Star Center. Thank you to the college. Um, this is something I will definitely take with me for the rest of my life. Um, I'm already kind of taking it into the classroom now uh, with my students. We're just getting into kind of teaching the foundations of government, and so much of what I saw firsthand here is stuff that I'm going to have to teach at least in the next month or so, so thank you. No questions? You did a very thorough job. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Uh, I've got one thing I'd say. Sure. Um, about 20 years ago, there was a gentleman from Chester County, uh, Mr. Simon, and who unfortunately is deceased now. But he was one of the uh, creators of, of this institution. And uh, he took me up there, and we spent a day uh, walking around uh, what was mainly a work site, and, and trying to come up with ideas for activities that young people could do, so it wouldn't be too boring just looking at documents. And we gave them, gave them our ideas, and I think you far surpassed us <laughs> in terms of, of your perception of what can be done there. Thank you. I, I did get to see some of the pictures of it being built, and it was pretty crazy to see the difference of what the final product looked like compared to when it was under construction. No more? Thank you. All right, thanks, Jake. And I, I so love hearing about what you're doing as a teacher now. And it's kind of amazing to think that these programs that you were helping with, the teacher programs, are things that people who've been teaching high school for 10 or 20 or 30 years apply for. And it's a huge highlight for them to spend a week or two doing it. And here you are, and you're just starting your teaching career. And you did it for two and a half months. So. We're just, we're really proud of you. Um, our next and next to the last speaker is Maria Comey, who is um, an English, a recent graduate in English and art history. She's from Falls Church, Virginia, and she worked at the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress. And I want to especially thank the Department of English, which co-sponsored Maria's Comedies by Fellowship. So welcome, Maria. Hi, um, I'm Maria. I actually did not graduate yet. Um, so I worked at the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress this summer. And a lot of people haven't heard of the Center for the Book, so I thought I would explain that. It's a small office within the Library of Congress that's actually privately funded, and they work for the promotion of libraries and literacy and the culture of the book. Um, so these are just some of the programs that they do. Um, they administer read.gov, which is a website that does a lot of literacy promotion and tools to help kids learn to read and to appreciate reading. They do a letters about literature program where kids write to an author, dead or alive, and talk about how um, an author or a book has influenced them. Um, the, they do the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, which is through the Children's Literature Center, and they do promotion you know, for children's literature. Um, I think the ambassador right now is Kate D. Camillo, so they get these really great and engaged authors of children's literature. Um, and then they have state affiliate centers in all 50 states and uh, the Virgin Islands as well that kind of help to promote this book culture on a smaller statewide level. And then of course they do the National Book Festival, which is probably their most famous program that happens every year. It happened a couple weeks ago actually. So a lot of what I did in my internship was actually helping them to prepare for that festival. It's a gigantic gathering of book nerds and it's awesome. So um, my job was basically to do whatever John Cole told me to do. He's the director of the Center for the Book, and he is amazing. He has an amazing memory. He can remember anything, and he knows everything about the Library of Congress. So it was a wonderful experience to work with him, and I was happy to do whatever he told me to do. Um, these are, so the... Center for the Book also oversees, like I said, the Center, um, the Young Reader Center, and then the Poetry and Literature Center as well. So this first picture is in the Poetry and Literature Center, which is where the Poet Laureate, it's kind of their ceremonial office where they work and where they come when they're in town. 
um, consultant in poetry is the original title for the poet laureate that they had when it was first founded. Um, this is Flat Stanley. He lives in the Young Reader Center. He's kind of a life-size greeter for children. And that is um, a page of the Hunger Games in Braille, which is another really cool thing they have in the Young Reader Center. Um, they have a lot of Braille books, and that sits in the corner. It's a giant, and it's really cool to see. Um, so one of the projects that I worked on this summer, and definitely my favorite project was putting together an exhibition about the history of the National Book Festival, which was, is, it is still on display around the time that this year's National Book Festival happened. It's um, the 15th anniversary, so they wanted to put together a display that's in the Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress, and it's going over all the history. So something that I did was gather a lot of the memorabilia from the past um, from the past book festivals, it started in 2001 um, and then up till today. So I had a lot of fun. I had to go through all the souvenirs, all the photographs. You know, there's tons of, there's a mouse pad, which seems like a really archaic thing now. Um, but I guess they gave that and people used it. Um, all this really fun stuff that I got to see how the book festival evolved over the years and the things they give out. And people still go crazy over all the souvenirs they give out. So that was a really fun thing to do. Um, I also really, this is a bookshelf that was in the office that I loved the subtitle of. I just think that's, I like that there was a whole category that we felt we needed to include the library, the drama within. Um, and one thing that I really enjoyed at the Library of Congress was the feeling that I got to peek inside the Library of Congress. It's such a big historical institution, and I felt like I was getting behind the scenes of everything. I got to go on tours in the manuscript division and see the sealed papers of like Supreme Court justices and all these really famous political figures. Some of them, they're not even allowed to be opened yet. They're marked with with a red sticker and you know it's open 15 years after so-and-so's death so it's very mysterious and awesome um, and you know I got to find out who the poet laureate was this year they just named the new poet laureate I got to find him out before everyone else knew um, which is really cool um, is Juan Felipe Herrera who's actually the first Latino poet laureate of the United States so that was really exciting um, I got to find out that the Librarian of Congress was retiring before everyone else knew about it. So that was in the newspapers, and I could, you know, say, well, I already knew that. So, you know. So that was really cool as a um, English nerd and generally nosy person. That was great. Um, we also got to see a lot of beautiful things, the beautiful architecture, everything in the Jefferson Building, which is the main building. This is the ceremonial office. Um, my boss director um, John Y. Cole, he knows everything about every inscription in the Library of Congress, every painting, every quote they used. He'll just rattle off exactly what it means, who painted it. It's really, really cool. Um, here's just some more cool things. Um, there's some really interesting decorations there. Um, the mask that lays at the feet of Athena is in a big mosaic. Um, that's the one on the right. It's in a big mosaic at the Jefferson Building. There's a lot of motifs with Athena and the owl, which represents her, because they both signify wisdom. Um, so that's a common motif at the Library of Congress. Um, and then I actually got to go back the week after school started and volunteer at the National Book Festival this year. Um, so it was really great to see all that come into fruition, because that's what most of the office had been planning. Um, throughout the whole summer. So I worked in, we had a corner for literacy where they had information for parents about the importance of reading aloud to your children, how that helps them to become better readers and to become better in school. Um, so basically I was just overseeing a series of people coming in to read to little children and reading in between. Um, some of the authors came to read to their own children's books that they wrote and other volunteers just came to read. And I, I mean, I read a lot in between because there was just a mass of unruly children that needed to be read to. Um, that was really fun. Um, and finally, I would like to conclude with this picture of the Librarian of Congress with Captain Underpants because this is the favorite picture that I found in all of the memorabilia and souvenirs from National Book Festival history. And I am responsible for this being in an exhibition about the history of the National Book Festival. So I feel like 
that was, you know, my main contribution, which I think was really meaningful. So, um, <laughs> I, but in all seriousness, I had a wonderful time. It was amazing. Thank you to everyone that helped to make this happen, um, the Comey Youth Bite and the English Department as well. Um, and enjoy Captain Underpants. Thank you. Great, thank you, Maria. And um, I should mention, um, speaking of the Library of Congress, that the Star Center and Miller Library are very excited about a new program that we're just launching and about to announce publicly this semester, um, which is a series of Washington College at the Library of Congress days, where we are going to take busloads of students to Washington, D.C. for three days this semester to do research um, on their senior theses or term papers, topics of their choosing, and people from the Star Center, staff from the, and faculty from the Star Center and Miller Library will be there to um, help them do their research in the world's greatest library. So we're very excited about that Library of Congress um, connection that Maria is also helping us to further. So our last speaker, um, yeah, Jennifer. Sorry. After you graduated, do you want to, would you like to go back and work there or um, have a career in I, I would love to work there. I mean, as, as thus far, I don't have a great plan of what I want to do, but it definitely helped me to figure out, mm -hmm. even within the library, there's so many different jobs that I got to see, you know, the archivists work with people who work in publications and editing and the center and with children. So it was, it was really great to see that all the other teams, especially as people like to say, English majors won't get a job. So. <laughs> <laughs> Great. No, no, thanks for the question, Jennifer. And um, our last speaker is somebody who worked with another institution that Washington College has a strong and long-standing connection with, Mount Vernon. Um, and our Comedies by fellow there was Ian Kulkazi. Ian is a history major, and he is from Merchantville, New Jersey. And welcome, Ian. Thank you. All right, so I'm Ian Cassie, and I spent my summer at George Washington's Mount Vernon, specifically in the Fred W. Smith Library for the study of George Washington on the estate itself. Um, the library itself is two, almost three years old, so I got to spend some time in a really fascinating, brand new almost building uh, with tons and tons of artifacts and, and documents and things to see. Um, one of my favorite things about the building itself is that uh, it was an American spruce, I think, that was the, uh, the wooden veneer to the entire first floor of the building. It was a huge tree, like six or eight feet wide in diameter, and I don't even know how tall, enough to build the whole first floor of the building, essentially. Um, so yeah, there's a fact about that for you guys. <laughs> This is George Washington, the Rembrandt Peel painting of him um, that I helped distribute to home schools that uh, learned about the portrait program that Mount Vernon has to offer. And if you're a school uh, anywhere, can go online at Mount Vernon and sign up for one of these paintings to be sent to you. And you can put it up in your classroom or your home school or wherever you teach or learn. Um, so I helped organize all of that. There was a stack of uh, I don't know, like 84 manila envelopes full of these, uh, and I sent them out to dozens and dozens of different home schools and schools. Um, one of the biggest projects that I worked on was the Lifeguard Teacher Fellows of 2015, and they are teachers who applied to the program and to Mount Vernon to get to spend three weeks of whenever they had off, usually the summertime because they're teachers. Um, for three weeks. Uh, they get a stipend for every week and they got chosen based on a project that they had that um, Mount Vernon could help them out in order to complete by either being at Mount Vernon or in the area. So if you wanted to, you could stay with your family around the area or they could house you there in uh, the quarters that they have for the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. 
Um, so some things that this involved were contacting experts that I thought might help them in their project, uh, setting up the meetings with those experts after I nailed down a date and a time for them to meet, um, drew up their schedules for their official welcome folders, uh, and organized tea and fellowship was in this picture to the right. Um, I did all that. That lemonade thing holds three gallons, just if you were curious. <laughs> it's very heavy, comes in three pieces. Um, I also helped to field any questions or concerns that the, the teachers had about being on the estate or who they should talk to for this or my key cards not letting me into this building, who should I talk to about that. Um, and there were six total fellows, so the entire month of July there were at least three fellows there and, and each of the, the months connected to that. Um, there were at least two, I believe. So. I got to learn about all these different projects that these teachers were involved in. Uh, one of the first teacher fellows that I helped was Julie Hewson. Um, and she was doing a play for elementary school kids. And uh, she was looking, one of her main issues was finding very specific people to include in her play, uh, whether it be uh, a slave who actually was there at Mount Vernon, uh, an overseer, a cook, uh, George and Martha were in it. Uh, George's stepkids were in it. Um, but I think that the, because she had a class of 34 kids, so she needed a character for all of them to play. So she was doing a lot of research on that. Um, and I helped her get connected with various people. And one of the people who all of the teachers uh, got sent to by me was Mary Thompson. And she was the historian for the library itself, and she knows absolutely everything. Uh, I walked into her office on the second day of my internship and I didn't see her, but she was there. She was just behind mountains of books. <laughs> and uh, I brought Julie to her uh, when she got there. And uh, like me, Julie didn't see her at first, but I told her she was there. Um, and I sat in on the first five or 10 minutes of their meeting and uh, Julie had all these questions and Mary just was walking around while listening at the same time and picking these books because she knew exactly where the book was, exactly what was in it, and exactly what part of her project that it would help. So uh, she was a big help and a generally nice person. So uh, This is a picture of Mount Vernon, uh, the actual house. Uh, it is currently actually being worked on um, at the moment, I think given a fresh layer of paint, uh, shingles put up on this, the roof. Uh, so there's a bunch of scaffolding around it right now. But this is what it looked like before that. And that guy in the picture going up the stairs probably didn't know, but he's famous now. <laughs> uh, the other thing that I hosted um, is pub trivia. So a different set of fellows was the summer residential fellows um, who got to come for a week and stay in quarters as well. Um, and they got to listen to all of these experts who came to talk uh, either from the George Washington University, uh, the George Washington Papers, Ed Lengel, um, I got to meet him, very fascinating guy. Um, so they got to stay for a week and listen to all of this programming, uh, and I also got to listen to all this programming too, which was awesome. Um, so I hosted it four times because there were four weeks of summer residential teachers, and uh, so I sort of revamped the previous pub trivia questions uh, and wrote 38 of my own. Uh, brand new. So most of the, the material came from Joseph Ellis's book, His, Excell His Excellency George Washington, um, which I really enjoyed reading and I now have a copy of my own. Um, the rest of the information either came from the Education Center, uh, the museum, or the Mount Vernon website. So I did a lot of digging um, for random facts or, or just generally good trivia questions. Um, so I hosted that usually on Monday nights, the first Monday night of the summer residential teachers actually being on the estate. Uh, it's actually really funny to, to be there and host because all of these teachers were there uh, drinking and, and eating good food that Mount Vernon gave them uh, and set up. And they actually sort of became like their students or, or what I imagine students to be like. There was uh, name calling, there was the blurting out of false answers <laughs> to try and throw off the other teams. There was some, it was a good time. Uh, they did get pretty loud though, so I had to use my, my big boy voice to sort of <laughs> get everybody's attention. Um, but it was, it was great, it was really fun. Uh, this is the lower garden. 
A uh, fun fact about all, all, the, all the gardens on the estate is that there's a, a picture drawn, I think George Washington might have drawn it himself, of the layout of his gardens and, and how he and what goes in every part. Because uh, while he was away at war, he actually did a lot of uh, micromanaging, um, writing letters to everybody on the estate, whether it be the groundskeeper or Martha, um, like, I want this kind of tree to go in this spot, and you should probably put this vegetable over here this time of year because of some reason or another. Uh, but there are a lot of letters that went back to, the, to Mount Vernon for that reason. And actually, uh, the leader of horticulture uh, walked me through uh, I think it was on my third day, and uh, it's not in this picture exactly, but if you can imagine more lower garden to the right, uh, there was a, a few rows of raspberries, and I got to sample some of those, um, and they're really good, <laughs> for the record. These are some of the pub trivia questions that I did write. Um, nobody shout out the answers because they're going to come up here in a little bit, but uh, this is just an example of, of some of the things that I, I came up with. Um, so yeah, before I give you the answers, you have to look at this picture of cows. Just appreciate that for a little bit. My brothers actually came to visit me, um, my, my mother and my grandmother. Um, and that day when we were walking up past the um, enclosure, uh, one of the cows was really close to the fence of the walkway. And my brother's like, can we, can we touch them? I was like, I don't know. Uh, you can try, just don't tell anybody that you're my brothers, because probably got me in trouble. But they touched it, and nothing bad happened. So, <laughs> so here are the answers to those questions. I don't know if anybody knew them, but uh, the first one does how many state quarters? Um, I mean, I, I did know the answers ahead of um, reading it to the people, but uh, I always messed it up. Like I would give away one half of the question or another. So, but I mastered it by the fourth time. I would either give away how many or, or one of the states for some reason, but I was just caught up in the moment. It was really exciting. Uh, the other thing I didn't know was that uh, at the Battle of Monongahela in the French and Indian War, there actually Thomas Gage and Daniel Boone were there on the battlefield. Uh, I had no idea that, or not even, I didn't even know to think that there are potentially other famous people that could have been there at the time, but lo and behold, Tommy and Danny were both there. <laughs> And then just the, the date of the first uh, State of the Union address, because that's an important date that everybody should know if they study history. Uh, this was one of my other big projects that I did. Uh, there was a document um, for, I think it was just for kids, or it was like a pamphlet that was passed out with like multiple choice questions on it, um, just for fun. But they were very dated and sort of, uh, like there was one for George and it was green and there was one for Martha and it was pink. And all the ones about Martha were just about like, what kind of shoes did she wear at her wedding and, and all of these very gender specific boring questions. So I, I was tasked with creating a new document that sort of put them both together and, and sort of brought them up to an equal importance because they are very equally important. And uh, Martha is often overshadowed by George, the first president. Um, so. I created a new document. I uh, followed all of the Common Core um, specifications uh, for Maryland and Virginia um, as far as this kind of a document is concerned. Uh, so I, I sort of laid it out as, um, so picture yourself as a kid going to a restaurant. Um, you're asked if you like a kid's menu, and you're a kid, so you want a kid's menu and the crayons that come with it. Um, so I, that's how I sort of laid it out. The front page was content and pictures with captions. Um, and the pictures could have been from the museum or the education center or stuff like that, and I chose them. Um, and then on the other side, there were activities. So you had a word find, you had a crossword, matching, image matching questions, and multiple choice questions. Um, and like all of this stuff enveloped both George and Martha equally. Um, so all of the answers to the questions on the back, you needed to read through. So I, I sort of sneakily made the kids who get these in the future learn a little bit, which was the goal. Um, so they had to read and uh, figure out the answers from the front. So they had to read every bit, like the pictures, they had to interpret those, they had to read the captions specifically, and, and all of the, every word essentially, <laughs> on the back side. So that was really fun to do, and I, I've been told that it's gonna be published uh, 
uh, I guess next summer probably, because all of the, the groundwork that I laid out was uh, done. So it was ha being handed off to a design team uh, in that department at Mount Vernon. So that was, that was really fun to do. Uh, and now that I look back on it, this is a pretty grim way to end my PowerPoint, but that is where George is now. That is his body, or what is left of his body in that sarcophagus. Uh, and it was so crowded when I took that picture that I couldn't really move over a little bit to get Bartha too, but she's there. You can sort of see on the very left the very edge of her sarcophagus as well. But um, one of the things I told everybody who's asked me about my adventure on Mount Vernon for the summer um, is that I walked there on my first day there. I got to just roam. I got the, the ID badge and everything that I could go anywhere I wanted. Uh, so that was the first place I went. Um, and it was kind of eerie, but in the coolest way possible. So um, I guess that would sum up my, my summer in a, a grim but cool and eerie way. Um, <laughs> but I would like to thank uh, everybody involved with, with my adventure at Mount Vernon and thank them from the bottom of my heart. It was really a great experience, and I look forward to uh, bringing it to my, my future life as a historian or teacher or, or what have you. So thank you. Any questions? I have one. Sure. How long was Daniel Boone in Washington's army? That's a good question. As far as I know, it was just the French and Indian War under uh, General Braddock and then later Washington. Um, but the last mention that I, I know of for sure of, is of him being at the Battle of the Monongahela. Um, so, yeah. Yes? Will we get to see the um, George and Martha thing that you is produced from all your work? I hope so. As soon as they, they have it done, they're going to let me know and send me a few copies. And then from there, I'll, I'll definitely pass one on to the CV Star Center. So it'll be here in the near future, I hope. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes. And so now you've developed a kind of philosophy of teaching. Is it fair to say that you think it's fair for a teacher to require students to read pretty much every book? <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, I do. I do think that's important. <laughs> I mean, I, I did before I, I wrote that, but uh, <laughs> it is. So I, I try to do that as often as I can. But I do take other history classes where the professor believes the same thing. So it amounts to a good, a good bit of reading, but I do my best. <laughs> Well, thanks, Ian, and I would just like to say a last um, thank you to all of our Comagees Bite fellows who not only did terrific work, but have also very generously shared it um, this year, even more than our fellows usually do. This group was posting very actively to Facebook. If you're not yet a friend of the Star Center on Facebook, you'll want to join because there's great stuff they posted. Um, they did these presentations. They wrote essays that we're going to um, try to post online as well. And finally, they all, um, or almost all of them, starred in a forthcoming film about the Comedies by Fellowships where our intrepid film crew actually went and visited them on site and interviewed them and showed them in action that's coming soon to a theater near you, or at least the Washington College website. So thanks again to everyone involved with the program and congratulations.